Recording is now on. Welcome to Vancouver, Megan. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. <laughs> okay, so th I'm going to stop like that. Okay, so as long as the recording just keeps going, right? Should yeah. keep going all the time. That's it. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank okay, you, Barry. Thanks so much, Barry. Okay, appreciate it. Chat more later. <laughs> so, yes. So it's May 11th, and here we are in Vancouver, BC. And I would like, if it's all right, for you to just start with your telling me your name um, and your professional credential. Right. I'm Joy Farah, and I'm a graduate of UBC with a Bachelor of Recreation Education degree, something they don't offer anymore, but um, I've worked uh, on and off in the field of recreation therapy in healthcare and love what I do. Um, so what year did you graduate from UBC then? 1972. Okay, and I think that that was perhaps before you were, has Joy Farah always been your professional name or did you have another name? Uh, yes, that's a good question. I, I, my maiden name was Ward, Joy Ward, and about a week and a half after graduation, I married my husband, a graduate of UBC in the School of Physical Education. And um, we've lived in the Vancouver area ever since 1972. And just because we're on camera, why don't you tell me your, uh, your Olympian history or your history as a, because you have kind of this dual identity oh. you as, a, as a recreational therapist and then you have a whole exciting history. <laughs> okay. A well, interesting. I actually skied, alpine skiing and cross country for the University of British Columbia the four years that I studied there. And then two years out after graduation, I got a phone call from a cousin of mine asking how much time I had. And of course, I think I put the phone down and did, did a little sigh. Oh, what does my cousin want me to volunteer for at the time? He was in charge of all of British Columbia high school sports. So he said that uh, they, whoever they were, were looking for women with athletic background to give rowing a try with the Montreal 1976 Olympics coming up. And um, no guarantees that you'd make it. And I just said, hey, I'm interested. Where do I go and when? And he said, 7 a.m. Saturday, Vancouver Rowing Club. And I remember saying, um, tell them, whoever them was, tell them I'll be there. And got off the phone, and I'm not sure if my husband was home at the time of the call, but as soon as I could, I certainly talked it over with him and got his support, not knowing it would be about a six-year endeavor. And um, he was my MSP, most supportive person. And I had a wonderful colleague at work, Moira Jones, who gave me leave of absence for rowing. Uh, fortunately, the location where I did recreation therapy uh, eventually was at uh, George Derby Center in Burnaby. And that was about a 10 minute drive to the rowing venue. If that hadn't have been so, I'm not sure if I could have pursued the opportunity, but I did row from 1974 until 1980 and um, fond memories of Montreal Olympic Games, disappointment with a seventh place result though, um, and with good coaching and some hard work by all of our crewmates. We did win bronze medals in the 1977 and 1978 World Rowing Championships. And then sadly enough, um, hoping to go for a medal for the 1980 Moscow Olympic Games, President Carter of the United States called a boycott of the 1980 Olympics. And to my knowledge, 34 countries joined that boycott. And that was very disappointing. Um, I. I didn't really want to end my career that way, but in the sport of rowing, there's no way I was going to train another four years towards Los Angeles Olympics. And um, yeah, it, uh, we went on a European tour. No one in rowing quit to my recollection. We all thought, well, perhaps at the 11th hour, maybe something might change, but no, it didn't. And um, that's, that's the end of my rowing career. But you're still obviously very active. Oh, I still compete to yeah. uh, the master's level in both alpine skiing and rowing. Yeah. Mm, that's nice. Okay, so that's your professional training. So you graduated from UBC in what year? 1972. 1972. 
And do you, and what date did you start at George Derby then? Well, interesting enough, uh, the fall of 72, I worked with uh, seniors, adults probably 60 and over, um, at Marple Oak Ridge Community Center in Vancouver. And then I heard an opening um, at George Derby Center. So I really worked the fall of 1972 uh, Marple Oak Ridge Community Center and then moved over right in December of 72 to George Derby Center and um, interesting I know upon graduation from UBC I thought perhaps I would work in municipal parks and recreation and that's why my husband and I chose to stay in the lower mainland figuring there was more opportunity for employment rather than heading to a small town both of us had grown up in small towns and um, I never thought that I would get into health care and recreation therapy. So I just say, God opened some doors for me, and George Derby Center was a wonderful uh, facility housing, if I recall, about 200 war veterans, all male, actually. And um, I was blessed a couple of years, or a year and a half into that, that uh, Moira Jones um, was introduced to me by our hospital administrator as my new boss. And uh, we got along just famously, um, loved her, uh, just appreciated working with her. I know that initially she, for one of the first questions she asked me was, are you published? And I said, no. Well, I soon changed that and certainly wrote about some recreation programs that we did and was published in a couple of recreation journals. <laughs> but she was a wonderful person to work with and challenged all her staff. She was head of rehab services, so of course that involved physiotherapy, occupational therapy. And when she took a job at Valley View Hospital, Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, um, I remember she said, Joy, there's not a position for you at the moment, but I'll create one and love to have you follow me. And at a certain point, I'd have to look back on the exact years, maybe early 1979, I moved to Valley View Hospital to join Moira there. And that facility was the provincial geropsychiatric hospital. So residents of 70 years and older with psychiatric challenges. And, um, and then what took me away from that was the birth of our first daughter. And we lived quite a distance from Valley View then at that time. So, but we stayed in contact um, with Moira, indeed, you know, good friends until her passing in 2015. Thank you. That was, that was a really nice synopsis. So I wanted, I wanted to take you back to those two institutions and ask you as much as possible if you can describe, first of all, the physical environment of George Derby. Yes, George Derby Center, uh, if I recall, there were about eight pavilions, so separate buildings away from our auditorium, we could call it, where we did most of the recreation events. So a bit of a challenge for those war veterans to get to our facility for some major events. Um, we actually fundraised and had some Royal Canadian Legions donate a few golf carts to give those who had mobility challenges the chance to easily get to our programs and get back to their pavilions again. Um, yeah, so it was in this kind of, it was in kind of a park-like setting? It's Beautiful acreage in Burnaby, uh, surrounded by trees. Um, the residents were certainly well cared for, and we certainly respected the fact that they were all war veterans, had served our country, and had tremendous history, of course. Uh, the pavilions were really their bedrooms, so there wasn't space for us to do much recreation therapy there with them and um, really my own personal philosophy in recreation therapy is to make the most of every day and focus on one's assets rather than disabilities whether it was a vision impairment and of course the mobility impairment um, 
just making their day a best day possible. And to this day, that's still my my um, philosophy. Is is that a recreation philosophy? Is that something you learned at UBC? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Was it? I'm curious to know whether it was a bit odd to go into geriatric care with rehab from UBC at that time. Maybe it was. I, I, you know, here I graduated indeed thinking municipal parks and recreation. For me, also growing up in a small town, I didn't have it role modeled for me. Although I must say my parents were very caring and I know my mom always took me in hand as a young child to visit those who were in care homes, even in a small town. So my family modeled a caring, a sense of caring and also making the, both, the best of each day. Yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering, you know, in 1970-72, ideas about dementia, um, dementia care, were just much more limited than they are today. So Indeed. I'm wondering if you can take yourself back and kind of reflect on the attitudes towards the elderly and their potential in a rehab situation. Definitely. Definitely. Um, I also feel that in the population that I was working with, the residents, having grown up, and they were all male, so they also grew up working all their lives and didn't have much in the way of planning for their spare time recreationally. And nowadays, I think people are indeed a little better at life balance, for sure. But these were all men who knew working. So as one in the recreation field would get to know what was some, did a resident have any pets? Did they love dogs, cats? Were they gardeners? Were they interested in flowers? Um, or even with the war emphasis, did they love model airplanes? As a recreation therapist, you want to find out a lot about the people you're working with. But these people maybe had new time on their hands and didn't know what to do. Um, many of them probably would have grown up with no television to watch. So maybe became addicted to watching television or too much of it uh, for lack of other opportunities. Um, we were very grateful with the Royal Canadian Legion involvement, both time-wise, funding-wise. They would host some wonderful dinners for our residents. Um, if I recall, more out with a visit out to their Legion branch. And um, Army, Navy, Air Force Veterans Associations, they were very kind to the residents of George Derby Center. Um, the Legion donated our bus, our wheelchair bus, and um, it was a combination of wheelchair and for ambulatory uh, residents. Um, wonderful memories of um, celebrating Remembrance Day. I mean, for those war veterans, that was the most important day of the whole year. So I knew I always was involved working with, um, with respect to what these war veterans had done for our freedom. So just getting to know a resident, whether they're a war veteran or and someone indeed with um, mental health challenges, find out their past, help them make the most of each day. And I'll never forget one resident of George Derby Center, a sweet man, I'm gonna say he was about 86 years old at the time in the mid late 70s. His wife who had mental challenges was housed at Valley View Hospital, Port Coquitlam where I eventually went on to work and I can't recall the number of years it had been and they hadn't had an opportunity to visit one another. Well, when I found out that uh, it was a high priority to bring these two together and he was a dear gentleman and I took him and as they embraced 
after not seeing each other for, I'm going to say, at least two years. Now, she wouldn't have maybe remembered that because of her mental illness and challenges and dementia at the time. But boy, since that day, this gentleman called me his guardian angel. And I sort of quietly wept as they embraced. And so I facilitated visits for them, um, basically the George Derby Center resident to go to Valley View Hospital because she wasn't in a scenario where she would be going out too much. But that's one of the highlights I'll remember and have indeed to this day. That's a lovely story. It is. And it's got me in tears. Uh -huh. So um, you've given me a pretty good idea of the patients at George Derby. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering if there's anything that you would add to it. I was just going to say, did a, were the, a lot of them single men or married men? Yes, that's a very good question, Megan. Um, oh, um, I'm going to say at that point, they were housed there because no other family member would be able to give them care. Um, I remember truly at my young age in the 20s, beginning to understand maybe the challenges of an addiction to alcohol. And I guess if some of us haven't been through a war, personally, we won't know. We cannot step in those shoes. And I speak of that even because my father was a fighter pilot in the Second World War and didn't talk that much about it and um, crashed his airplane on the Burma front, walked through the jungle. So even I had that knowledge. but. We really can't walk in another's shoes. So with our own personality, our level of empathy, our ability to learn about someone else and the life they've lived to whatever age they are, um, that can help us, I feel, both in the empathy category but also as recreation therapists, trying to help them, whatever their scenario, living scenario is, to make the most of each day. And um, the feedback I receive in this is just so fulfilling. I love this profession. Um, so, oh, okay. I'm going to try closing the door. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Do you think that that sound oh, is, is that person gone? Uh, could be. Uh, S sorry, sorry. Oh, I thought Barry had closed it, but I must say I oh, didn't look. I think the two doors have to be closed together at the same time. Yes. And now that'll kind of lock shut. Excellent. Oh, so I'm sorry. Think that, that was such a beautiful oh, piece. Do you think that we could do that again? Sure. So I sure. asked you, yes. my jump off question was something about married versus single men, and you talked a little bit about how much you learned. From, right. from these, like about life. Right? Mm -hmm. The residents of George Derby Center, and this is only my recollection now, um, indeed many of them m might have been single, um, even single all their life, or with them being elderly as well, um, perhaps their families indeed had no way of caring for them or having them live with them. Um, so this was a residence that did provide all-round care uh, for these war veterans. That was the first criteria for them to be housed there. Um, social workers would handle more of, you know, admissions from what was Vancouver's Shaughnessy Hospital. If any of our residents living there needed acute care help, they would be taken back to Shaughnessy Hospital in Vancouver. Um, I think for one, even as young as I was, unless we've walked in someone else's shoes, it's hard for us to understand someone else. And that's where, of course, education comes in and um, studying. And, but in the field and profession of recreation therapy, if we can help make a single day that much better for someone else, and especially those in long-term care facilities or their home, um, 
what a satisfying career this has been for me or profession for those who might be considering. Um, I certainly learned a lot on the job. In fact, I, I truly can remember um, kind of learning a little bit more about a di Did we turn it off at this end? No, it's recording now. Okay. God. That's okay. No <laughs> Maybe it just turned off automatically. Battery saver oh or something God. feature. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I think I'm going to be a wreck. By the You're my guinea pig. That's okay. Let, let's, so you, so, okay. So you're working at George Derby with this group of men and you've come from, you're a young woman mm -hmm. and come from your training. This is your second job. And then Moira arrives. So, Describe what she did at George Derby. Moira Jones, an amazing woman. And I can vividly remember when the hospital administrator at George Derby Center was touring Moira around, showing her the facilities and introduced her to me, uh, saying, Joy, this is your new boss. Well, I hadn't even known they were advertising for to hire someone to be in charge of rehab services, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and recreation therapy. Um, we hit it off from day one. I was thrilled. It really was a blessing. Um, Moira, indeed, her first question to me was, ha are you published? And I had this blank look on my face. Um, my answer was no. And she certainly challenged me to write about some of the programs that we eventually would do and did over the years that I did work with her. She had an amazing uh, compassion for caregiving and treating the whole person, not just any Band-Aid approach of say from physiotherapy point of view, a part of the body. She, with her OTPT background, um, she had come from Ontario, um, she truly was the top 5% of a bell curve, shall I say. She challenged everyone who worked with her to be the best they could be. And um, it was fun to work with her. She had a sense of humor. Um, she loved dogs, and I know we implemented a pet therapy program, bringing in dogs who would be suitable. Um, and we have that certainly as a program in the facility where I'm working now. Um, those animals that have been certified <laughs> to be gentle and um, not mind residents petting them, you know. Um, Moira was just amazing, uh, fun to work for, and uh, for me, my scenario with sports, she granted me leave without pay to be able to pursue my international and Olympic rowing career. I was very grateful for that because I loved what I did. And Moira said to me, Joy, you recruit, you train, and get someone to take over, plan ahead, long-range planning, if everything is running fine, we won't miss you. <laughs> so that was fine with her. And um, I was very grateful to Moira and a friend uh, for life. So you told me that that she brought in dogs. Now, was, now I do know that that's not uncommon now. But it makes me think perhaps she was an, you might want to speak to her as an innovator. Like, was that an innovative practice? Did she have other innovations, things that were outside the box? Yes, indeed. I know it would have started with Moira bringing in her own dogs. <laughs> um, truly, Moira also loved horses. And I do have a few photos in my album of memories of those days. We would take residents to, obviously through a fence, get close to some horses. Anything we could think of, the sky's the limit on creativity. Um, speaking of war veterans, there's the annual in August Abbotsford Air Show. We would take a busload of residents out there and, oh, for them to come close to an airplane if they had served in Canada's Air Force. Oh, that was a highlight of the day. And yes, um, anything creatively we could imagine 
we would try to do. And one of the programs, both at George Derby Center and then when I went on to work at Valley View Hospital with her is we established a great, I called it great for awesome, great grandparenting program. Many children in daycare centers then perhaps didn't have grand grandparents living close by, so we made visits to schools or daycare centers and even some with the war veterans might have been strategically around Remembrance Day for those who were willing to be interviewed by children. Um, yeah, this was exciting and at Valley View Hospital, Port Coquitlam, Bridge Columbia, we would go out to spend time at a daycare center with the children and maybe have if our residents could read them a story, we would do that. And as far as um, parental permission from the organize or the daycare centers, I'm sure they took their steps to, you know, have permission for those children in care to welcome what were total strangers from a nearby hospital. But we we looked after those details in our planning for recreation therapy. I think things were a little less. Yes, I think so too. It made me think of that, but I thought I'd throw it in. <laughs> but I'm, but so, but I'm just challenging just slightly on that because yeah, I'm to think. you previously talked a little bit about alcoholism and so I'm wondering, were there certain, uh, did you interact with all the residents at George Derby? Did you take any resident or was there sort of a selection process for residents who got certain kinds of rehab programming? You know? Megan, that's a very good question. Even in the work I do today, we truly, as a recreation therapist, you want to get to know the individual. Now, some are easier to relate to or want, want to be involved both on an individual project or perhaps in a group setting, even general entertainment, I'll call it. But I can recall vividly a wonderful man. And now I'm sure he might have been 89 or 93, doesn't matter, quite elderly. And his name was Mr. Plumtree. And he would not participate too much because he didn't want to join all those old fellows for any group function. They were obviously, he thought he was, and I admire him, probably so young at heart that everybody else around him seemed older than he was. So um, I fondly remember that. That's great. Sorry, I just needed to cut because I, you know, didn't know what, I, I was sort of forgetting your question again. <laughs> but Mr. Plumtree I, came I to mind. I asked you whether whether some of the old guys, perhaps you might not have taken them out to the schools or mm -hmm. to the daycares. Mm -hmm. Because, and I'm wondering if you worked with all the residents or if you worked, if they, if some of them were, I don't, I don't know. Like that's what I'm wondering is, is were some of them more drawn into the therapies or not? Uh, Megan, I think naturally the, the world would be pretty dull if we were all the same. Yes. And there are those who choose to be loners and are happy with that. And there's others who are much more social. And even in the work that I do to this day in long-term care, um, indeed, if someone is more bedridden and can't do too much or doesn't want to, um, by knowing your clients individually, we in the field of recreation therapy can certainly plan accordingly to what is appropriate. And often if in doing one's planning, a resident themselves can't tell you a little bit. We learn a lot from their past, depending on their age, of course. And I do work with some as young as 25 year olds here at um, George Pearson Center in Vancouver. Um, but the more we get to know about them, there's how we can plan what's appropriate. Yes, indeed, there are some people that are quite happy and doing their own thing. And um, way back in the 70s, before the days of the internet, 
you know, indeed a lot has changed because in the work that I do now, many can, even if they're a quadriplegic, can access the internet by um, sip and puff from their mouth and uh, we can arrange setting up email addresses for them, etc. But way back in the 70s, early 80s, we didn't have some of those opportunities. I think one of the things that both George Derby Centre and Valley View Hospital um, were grateful for was a vehicle, whether it was wheelchair bus or even a regular bus for ambulatory residents, for them to get out of their environment, which often is four walls and a roof. So to be get to get away from that, even if it's down the hallway to a much more um, attractive, um, stimulating environment can be therapeutic in my own personal opinion. So um, whatever those working in our profession can do for those with mental health issues or just um, because they're confined to a care facility, um, it enhances their day and makes life a little better. So I, I mean, I think that uh, what I'm starting to get an idea about Moira Jones is, I mean, I already have some ideas about her, but I'm starting to get an idea of her as quite an empathetic person, that what she was doing at George Derby was um, meeting those guys, because they were all guys, where they were, right? So if they were interested, so they were interested in the guys that had been in the war and been in the um, planes, like in the Air Force, they would want to go to the Abbotsford Air Show. Mm -hmm. the, the guys that were, um, whatever, the vet's day was really important because it was mm -hmm. really important to them. Yes. And I see part of her model of therapy is, is very, well, I mean, you've said it about learning the individual, but it, it's very much a case of meeting these people where their interests are. I think exactly, so. and often more really in in getting to know an individual, finding their likes, and focusing on the assets they have, which you know some indeed have dementia. So um, knowing the individual, and challenging yourself as a professional to be creative in coming up with how can life be a little better. Moira Jones indeed modeled that. Um, she was energetic. She was devoted to providing the best possible care. And um, it was a pleasure to work with her. Any idea she welcomed, she challenged us to brainstorm, um, to think how could we do things better. and. Um, even those days, I know I learned a lot working with primary caregivers, nursing staff, nursing um, nurses and care aides who do the grunt work in getting people up and you know ready for the day. Or if they can't get up and out of bed, um, how can we bring our rehab services, including recreation therapy, to the resident at the bedside? Um, Moira modeled sincere care for those that needed care of whatever at whatever level. That's really nice, yeah. I just, that was a piece that I hadn't really got from her and clearly she was really a visionary. Visionary, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so what was her vision? Let me just pause on this yeah, a take sec. Your time. Because she definitely, she had an idea of the best it could be, right? One thing I appreciated about Moira Jones, she was the first to say she was totally unathletic. And she always made mention that I came into her life as a, an athlete. And um, I watched her embrace my endeavors and support me. She was a tremendous supporter of 
individuality in both residents, clients were caring for, as well as her staff. And I'm really certainly so grateful to that. That's a really neat piece, actually, because it would be another thing that I've got about Moira was that she was she would pick the best but she would support each person and, and and that's a really cool piece of that so she was supporting you to your strengths yes and encouraging you to publish mm -hmm. and encouraging you to do what you thought was good to run with your ideas yes. to, to, and so was more this is still early 70s that this is the very beginnings of feminism was she a supporter of, of women particularly or did she do you think she was a feminist oh absolutely absolutely um she juggled parenting and full-time work and did it well and she just supported her staff with their endeavors um just a sec, let me give you a chance to edit there um Both at George Derby Center and at Valley View Hospital, Moira was so supportive of music therapy. Indeed, she was musical herself. She had played, um, I believe, the organ in her church in Ontario at some point in her life and really knew the value of even group plus individual music therapy. And that is... Um, to this day, the music therapy department in the facility where I'm working now, they are part of the team, the music therapist, uh, because they're such a specialty in that regard. And Moira knew that way back in the 70s. So it, that was totally cutting edge. Indeed, yes. And another thing I know Moira supported me doing was when I took maternity leave for our firstborn. She encouraged me to, and set it up, um, through Douglas College in New Westminster, British Columbia, I was able to work from home even after the birth of our first daughter. Um, I supervised recreation therapy technician students out on practicums. Um, perhaps, I, I think it was the professors there who set up the practicums. I didn't have to do that like finding their placements. But I took on students because I could work flexible hours to see how they were doing on their practicums and if they were meeting their goals and objectives that they had set. So I think Moira's example of juggling family and work for women was cutting edge and leading edge. And because my husband and I had moved quite a distance from Valley View Hospital at the time of our first daughter's birth, uh, in the Vancouver area, transportation-wise, it was not a possibility for me to have gone back to that, but we did stay in touch. And Moira was the author of um, videos on giving better care to the Alzheimer's or dementia resident. And I helped her with her production at Robson Square Media Center, the premiere of a video that she created. So we enjoyed keeping in touch over the years, indeed. Yeah, she was a networker. Yes, definitely. And then, so I see that she supported you after, when you were no longer working mm -hmm. with her, she was still tracking your career and trying to support you in your career. I was grateful. Moira took a personal interest in our two daughters over the years, and she would sign Tante Moira, Auntie Moira, even though she wasn't an aunt, but we kept in touch. Oh, I knew a very valuable friendship, both professionally and just socially with Moira. Always a fan, a tremendous fan of the work she did and went on to do globally, worldwide. She was leading edge. Her father um, had come down with dementia and that was the catalyst for her even intensified personal interest in dementia and assisting caregivers even in a facility where he was placed to give better care to those with dementia. I recall one time fondly um, my husband, Moira asked my husband to take her father fishing 
and he had come out from Ontario. And on this fishing trip up the Sunshine Coast of British Columbia, her father asked questions, what lake am I on? And he showed evidence of having a challenge when given food, how to feed himself. And my husband, bless his heart, is it? Scary. Okay, okay. <laughs> and you know, in the future, you'd always be able to catch me audio wise over a phone call. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so. I just, I'm the yes. only reason I'm stressed about it is because I want to get some of this wonderful stuff on the teaching resources. So, for sure. But we will, you will probably be here in June when I come out, and if I have to haul the camera and the tripod oh, out again, sure, I will. Sure, sure. It'll all work out. Yes. Um, so, so what I'm aware of is that you describe patients and facilities at George Derby. Um, and now I'm wondering what you faced when you went to Valley View. Yes, Valley View Hospital was the, at the time, provincial geropsychiatric hospital. And I may have mentioned that a resident there had to be 70 years or older with psychiatric challenges. And I can even think of one woman who probably maybe is a relative of mine actually almost maybe needed to be at a facility like that because at that age, over 70, that generation, I can recall her husband didn't have much in the way of recreation interests. So when he reached retirement, Maybe here's a woman having her husband around all the time and not knowing <laughs> how to cope. And that brought on huge stress for that woman, um, a relative of mine. So I think at the time in the late 70s, early 80s, anyone over 70, indeed retirement and from my passion of recreation, if people don't have recreational interests or pursuits, that could lead to challenges both in a marriage and living in a home close together um, or even as bodies, as we deteriorate somewhat in aging, um, that can be a challenge. And it was great that the province of British Columbia at least had a facility to, at that time, be able... I've forgotten how many residents we had at Valley View Hospital then, um, but indeed, the field of rehabilitation services, which Moira Jones led so capably, um, didn't have when she hired me to move to Valley View Hospital, didn't have a recreation therapist on staff. So um, we could be innovators, and um, we were, I feel, and I was grateful for that opportunity. It was tough to say goodbye to George Derby Center, but we had laid a foundation there that anybody should have been, and I think did well, uh, follow us. And, and um, But I enjoyed this new challenge and to have the opportunity to, to continue to work with Moira Jones. Yes. So it, at George Derby, I got the impression that you actually didn't really have a, like that there were the pavilions where the men slept, lived. Yes. There must have been a dining room. Was there, was there a space for you to do rehab stuff? Do you remember? Like, was there? At uh, George Derby mm -hmm. Center in Burnaby, we had an, an auditorium in a separate building from the individual pavilions where residents ate. And you know, I've almost forgotten, but I believe some of them did m move from their bedrooms in these pavilions to a dining hall for their meals. Yes, but we had space for recreation events. But often is the challenge, even in the facility where I'm working today, to move people, even at whatever disability they might be challenged with, to move them to an event, whether it's a group event or an individual project or pursuit. Uh, whether it's out to uh, some raised garden beds for a gardening program at a certain time of year, of course, um, we often rely on volunteers to help us big time in, in recreation therapy. Yeah, because it would be a big job to get 
move people. Um, so what was the setup of Valley View? Do you remember? Valley View, if I recalled, we did have a facility, an auditorium as well, but there was the main, shall I call it, more like a however many stories hospital building and various pavilions there as well. So similarly, yes, we needed to, will in recreation therapy, we have the challenge to move residents from where they're housed or where their bed is either to a recreation room or bring recreation to the resident, depending. Um, when you think of it with um, someone who was an avid reader, well, maybe their vision has deteriorated or they can't hold a book. What can we do? Can we bring them from the, the local public library? Can we bring them taped books? And in those days, it would have been a cassette tape. Nowadays, so much we can access online and set up accounts for residents to um, be online or even if they have their own television set, have and if they have the finances to have pay-per-view TV, to enhance their many hours that they might spend confined to a bed. Yeah. So some of the residents at Valley View were bedridden. Oh yes, yes. Yes. And do you, did you do you have like you don't have? I'm, I can find this out from somewhere else, but I'm just kind of curious about the gender breakdown. I can't remember. Uh, all male war veterans at George Derby Center, Valley View Hospital. Gosh, I have forgotten. Okay. So that's a yeah. very good it, question in the demographics. Is. Yeah. And there were other, there were two other kind of uh, branch plants of Valley View. So there was Dell View in Vet Vernon, and then there was Skeena View up in Terrace. Does that, do you have any memory of those other yeah. facilities? You know, provincially in British Columbia, indeed, I knew there were perhaps other facilities giving care closer to home to where someone had grown up or lived um, but I sorry I don't know well, too much very about them yeah because those other places were still in operation in some format so they may have been kind of like made more local but it's just interesting yes. I always heard that Valley View was sort of the the Provincial. flagship yes. institution right yes. so it kind yes. of makes sense like, um, uh, so Moira said she was not the first person to do rehab at Valley View, right? But she was hired and obviously given money to expand their program. And I understand that she used a kind of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach and that she, she called on the services of not just a recreational therapist like you and the new music therapist, but also had, you know, the chaplain involved. And it seemed to me to be pretty amazing, this kind of multidisciplinary way of pulling different therapeutic professions together for elderly psych patients. So I was wondering if you could just riff on that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, Moira Jones, with her background in and a degree that covered both occupational therapy and physiotherapy uh, from the province of Ontario, um, had, a, a, had a respect for all the other professions that need to work as a team to give top-level care to a resident. A great deal of respect for that and um, not just a band-aid approach of a of treating a part of a person, the whole person. So yes, um, spiritual care was uh, respected, the music therapy, occupational therapy, recreation therapy, physiotherapy, and, and a respect for nursing care. And if nurses maybe had had, um, how can I word this, their background, maybe just specifically nursing, uh, in those years, Moira really helped nurses understand the role of the other professions in rehab services if they 
weren't aware of we could go the extra mile uh, because nursing care is so primary and um, so needed, of course, but in the other hours of a day that a person has, what can the other services, how can we all work together to give the best of care? Thank you. Um, okay, I'm looking at my, um, so, so I have, I, I totally get that you're a very positive person mm -hmm. that, and, um, but I have also heard that there was some friction between Moira's team at Valley View and the nursing team. Do you want to speak to that? Or oh, that I can certainly. Uh, you know, Moira Jones is in the top of the bell curve, shall I say. Um, if a job is worth doing, it's worth doing well. And even as we might observe other standards in another profession, really as a team, we should be working, this is what I learned from her, working to elevate the excellence, deliver excellence to clients, residents that deserve the best of care 24-7. And if the rehab services field were new to some of nursing staff, in other words, new budgets allowed to hire from music therapist, recreation therapist, um, if that was something new to the primary care nursing people, yes, adaptations needed to be made. If, for instance, recreation was going to take someone out of the facility, you have to work with nursing care respecting how long it takes nursing staff to get people up in the morning and ready, say, for an outing. Um, and putting that in the book to make sure and making sure a ward clerk or nursing staff needed or re needed reminding that so-and-so was going out. Um, yeah, that can, if, if there are new procedures anywhere in any area of employment, um, there can be initial adjustments to be made. And, um, you know, that desire to be the best one can be and give the best of care was always Moira's standard. And yes, perhaps sometimes, um, if this was new to many, especially nursing staff, there was a little friction. But I think over time, respect was gained by being earned, by helping educate the team, other team members, as to the value of the contribution your profession can make to a better day for a resident. Yes. Um, was there was there anything that you that you tried that was a, that didn't work? But do you remember any? Oh. I mean, she was an, a woman of ideas, uh -huh. right? Oh, maybe I have to catch up on that. I can't. Thing. And we're, so I've, sort, I've got an idea of the sort of special things you did for the George Derby residents, which I can see were really focused around, in a way, around male culture and their interests yes. um, and their own life histories. Mm -hmm. But what did you do at Valley View? Like, do you remember specific kind of events that you were involved mm. in? You know, that's hard for me to recall, but we did step up. The great grandparenting program that's a highlight i can remember and the others maybe i'll have to think about it well, a bit i can perhaps throw out some ideas yes i wonder if now you were working with women did you do any cooking did you do any sort of sewing or any knitting things do you remember did you um did you do any gardening? You know, I, because I've been working about nine years now in Vancouver at a long-term care yeah. facility, that's in my more recent memory. Yeah. Um, and indeed we do. We do have a baking program. Yeah. We have a gardening program. Um, we would have thought of those things then. I'm just having maybe um, no, challenges to recall I mean, that. This is like so long ago. <laughs> uh -huh. um, let me just think. Um, so you talk, we've talked about Moira a lot. 
But I wonder if you have any other people, either at George Derby or at, um, at Valley View, that were significant people, significant team members, right? Indeed, the music therapists. Um, my mother was music hall. I had to take piano lessons, and I played two instruments in high school band, but the piano, I didn't go skiing on the weekend until I'd done my hour a day. So I knew the value of music, um, but I appreciated their talent because I wasn't gifted musically. I mean, I pleased my mom and took the lessons anyway, but I have a great deal of respect for, as I watch even in the present job that I'm in, a music therapist both individually working with someone or in a small group and to see the joy and excitement or even a range of motion moving an arm or a limb with a musical instrument uh, I have a lot of respect for the music therapist and uh, love to sit in maybe and see what they're doing on various wards where I work now yeah, the, um, what little, you know, I've, you have worked for decades in this field, and I'm trying to play catch up as a historian, mm -hmm. right? But the, what I hear about music therapy is that it's a very promising practice with geriatric patients, right? Yes, indeed, with geriatric care, there are so many deficits from vision, hearing loss, mobility. Um, so whatever modality can be used in a most positive way to reach a person focusing on the assets that they have left, depending on their age or their debilitation of health care, health process, um, I just admire what the field of music therapy can do. And wonderful that there are programs training people with the talent in that area because I hope when <laughs> I'm a little older, if I'm in need of this kind of care, that there will be people to look after me with a variety of modalities to make my aging life a little better. So what I get to also that the, that kind of thing that you're describing and, and you've got, it's so embedded in your professional character, right? Like you're you you just embody rehab okay. therapy, right? But that is different than what the nurses are doing, because they're you you're you're yes you're tending the body, but you're tending the spirit too, aren't you? Absolutely. And at the facility where I'm working right now, I had an instant that there's that balance between risk and safety, and I know the family wouldn't mind me sharing this little scenario that I did recently, and the resident has since passed away, but it pleases me that one of his last memories would have been the fact from Vancouver, BC, I took this resident across on a ferry to Bowen Island, a small island off of West Vancouver, uh, with certainly no hospital, so if any emergency was needed, that was a little bit risky, but the family and the resident willingly signed a form to take responsibility for this, and I did my recreation therapy research and got a couple of phone numbers of even a physician that lived on Bowen Island, and knowing too where Lionsgate Hospital is in North Vancouver, if I would need to have an unplanned visit to that hospital. And with BC Ferries, they kindly offered me, um, it's kind of like pre-boarding assistant, guaranteed boarding on a certain small ferry. And the, that day for that family and that resident who actually hadn't even been out of bed, that's why it was quite high risk, in the nine years I'd worked here, um, that would have been one of his last memories. And the family thanked me profusely even later on. He eventually passed away, um, not related <laughs> to that outing. But the doctor gave 
the physician ultimately indeed gave the permission. But for this resident, because he hadn't been comfortably seated in an appropriate wheelchair, the only wheelchair he really used was a commode type to be transferred from his bed for showering. So this was quite um, bold. Shall oh, does the battery sort of die off? I plugged the battery in all last night. Okay. I'm just hoping yeah. this is working. Sure, but you'd certainly get some audio if you had to do other graphics and, and you could get me audio wise. I'm, I'm not going to worry. Yes. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a historian. I'm just really appreciating your oh, stories about okay. this because it's giving me a fuller picture. Okay. Um, and I should be a better historian myself, <laughs> <laughs> amateur-wise, well, to, to recollecting my memory. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it is, it oh, like... I could tell you one unique Vancouver 2010 story, if you'd like, oh. of a resident from here. I know it's not valid, but if you, in your guidelines. Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. One of my most recent, shall I say, 2010 Olympic sized memories that I certainly have permission to talk about. One of our residents, a quadriplegic in his early 30s from a mountain biking accident, yes, he was to carry on Thursday, March 11th, 2010, the Paralympic torch. Now, being a quadriplegic, he wouldn't have been able to carry, but there was a stand set up on the side of his wheelchair, and this was to be downtown Vancouver. I wasn't assigned to work that day. My boss and one of our rec programmers went downtown Vancouver. Well, his ventilator malfunctioned, and we do have a, a 20 residents on ventilators here at George Pearson Center, where I'm working now. For whatever reason, it malfunctioned which initially when I heard that, I was so glad it wasn't me working that day. However, first responders, um, fire department actually it was, and they were in the vicinity of St. Paul's Hospital, downtown Vancouver, all things worked out well. Sadly, he didn't carry the torch that day. So from a recreation therapy standpoint, I thought, what can we do for this resident to carry his, I called it, his virgin torch because he didn't get to carry that torch that day. It hadn't been used. His family were from Nova Scotia and they gave permission for media to come to George Pearson Center in Vancouver where I work. Nursing staff dressed the gentleman in his uniform, torch carrying uniform. I, through my volunteer efforts during 2010, came in touch with um, a friend to this day, an occupational therapist from North Vancouver who had carried the torch that day herself. And I said, would you come and join us, mitts on and all, and in your uniform, bring your torch. Well, we did our own little mini torch relay out from Ward 2 at George Pearson Center where he was housed and along West 57th in through the parking lot. As many wheelchair residents that could join us did, we had refreshments. Uh, afterwards on the ward and his face you could tell by his eyes and the countenance his countenance he was beaming inside he couldn't talk but we knew it was a red letter day a red mitten day we'll call it for George um, Der, George Pearson Center in Vancouver and the Cur Vancouver Courier came to cover the story and there was a photo and an article and uh, that was just truly a highlight in the latter days of his living here. He's since passed away. But if recreation, if we can seize the moments um, at the time that's happening locally, go for it. So, um, oh, you know, one, one of the questions that my uh, colleague wanted me to ask you was there's did, did, was, is, was her, Moira's approach at George Derby and Valley View to work, like, did she ha see, use rehab as sort of involved in every aspect of people's lives, or was it sort of more scheduled rehab sessions? Do you understand that? Like, with Moira's and my work at 
George Derby Center in Burnaby, um, truly often physiotherapists, occupational therapists will work with clients or the residents on scheduled times because of staffing ratios and the equipment they have, indeed people need to be scheduled for those appointments. But if we could tie in, especially at George Derby Center where the residents were housed in separate buildings, a distance from where physiotherapy department was, for instance, and our recreation center, if we knew a resident was making the trek down for their physio appointments, we would try and tie in with with a recreation event or whatever was appropriate. So yes, melding together, um, keeping in mind the specific goals for a specific, the resident care plan, shall we call it, specific goals for the various departments to be working with the resident at that time and time of day. And mm -hmm. I remember working indeed overtime the odd evening event or weekend event, and especially with the war veterans, always I was working the stat holiday of November 11th. Yes, yes. And do you, so at Valley View, um, I understood that you would create a care plan that everybody would, all the different um, therapists would be involved in creating a care plan for somebody. Is that how it worked? Because I don't really know this stuff, right? <laughs> You know, <laughs> even my memory is failing me somewhat just right now. But to this day, in the facility where I'm working now, yes, every profession, every team member has their input into the plan of care. And now from even the annual, six, the annual reviews and six-month reviews for those in care, the recording notes are in a resident's chart, and more and more, we're just switching from the handwritten paper to doing it online. And it certainly makes it easier updating it when it's online, so too. I'm wondering, um, I just, uh, uh, don't worry, because I'll be talking to other people, and somebody's yes. gonna remember that part for me. Yeah, how the, Valley View. Carrie Brooks seems to have a very clear memory oh, okay. of Valley View of some, some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, So I have, um, I have a couple of questions which are really about, um, about the, I guess, I guess they're, okay, but this is one that my colleague had. D did you, do you think that rehab therapy or creative arts therapy, I don't know what you'd like, prefer to call mm -hmm. it. Um, can be an alternative to pharmaceutical medication. Oh, absolutely. Uh, of course. Um, and Moira, was, Moira Jones was certainly a promoter of alternate therapies than just drugging someone out of their mind. Uh, and we do work in, in the care that I'm with now. Certainly the pharmacist is on the team and has the input. And I see more and more the MD, the doctors listening to what the pharmacist has to say on even dosage or, or can we eliminate this particular drug? I see it hasn't been used for a while. Can we take that off the, the resident profile? Um, indeed, in the past, oh, I would say when there weren't the professionals trained in the various interdisciplinary approach and there wasn't maybe funding to hire music therapists, recreation therapists, I guess for the nursing staff, perhaps pharmacological treatment and blotting people out was sadly the way it was. Um, so nowadays, certainly having worked a long time ago and more recently, I see indeed the, oh, how can I word it, kind of um, indeed, um, well, professionally the minimizing any 
pharmacological drug treatment. Yeah, so that a resident can be as mentally alert as possible. And of course, such an individual treatment plan necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I thought that that was an interesting observation to think of. I mean, this is treatment. You were giving treatment. We were. Um, but a different kind of treatment than um, the nurses would have been giving. Not that the nurses just handed out drugs or something. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what kind of pharmaceuticals would have been used at Valley View in yes. the 1970s or even at George Derby. Um, what what kind of medications. Mm -hmm. But I do know that there was quite a bit of medication out mm -hmm. there for elderly people by the 1970s. Yes, yes. And, you know, over the years for opportunities for young people to pursue their profession of choice, there are more jobs available now. I think even provincially for budgets for health care, those of us that look after the non-nursing care, primary care issues, have gained a lot of respect because of what we've been able to do in taking over certain portions of a resident's day and how they spend their day and how they're challenged to be stimulated mentally, physical movement, the whole thing, and the area of interest from gardening to pet therapy and things like that. Yeah. Um, if, you know, if you had just putting yourself back in those early days mm -hmm. and as a young woman working with Moira at George Derby and working with Moira at Valley View um, with people with elderly people who had mental health issues. So putting yourself back in what you learned there and what you did there, what would you want to tell a person who is just going out into the, into the field of working with elderly people? What lessons do you think that you learned there or what did you see that worked? Mm -hmm. um. The sky's the limit. Be as creative as possible. The rewards are huge if you're new into this field of working with those with mental health challenges. And from what I've learned over the years, um, if we can contribute to making even one day a little better for those who are challenged in this way, uh, it, it's just so rewarding and um, gain all the knowledge you can from your university professors and uh, be a leader in the field. Um, be creative, dream big. Um, yeah, the sky's the limit. I don't know if I answered that quite that was right. lovely. Okay. You, I really hope this damn thing is working. Okay, uh, and one other thing, I don't know yeah. whether um, this would come in at all, but um, with some of the new facilities being built for the 2010 Olympic Games, I actually took one of my residents here to a brand new facility. In fact, it wasn't even finished because the architectural banner was in the hallway and my resident did not fit in the elevator. Do you want me to cover that at all? I think we could leave that, but yes. I guess the, I guess, oh. but you know, there, you might want to say something because you obviously had limitations at George Derby. The space limited to a certain, the space shapes what the potential is. Yes. So what is, and I don't know what it was like at Valley View, but how does, what would have been the perfect space at George, at, let's just say because I'm, this is supposed mm. to be about mental health, what would have been the perfect space? space at Valley View for residents? Ideally, wouldn't it be nice if those needing health care in facilities had their own room? Or maybe just one other roommate. Some people who truly tend to be loners are happy to be in a single room. Others may need 
Uh, they may feel lonely and love to have a roommate. Um, the housing scenario is certainly dictated by budgets, provincial budgets in health care. Um, I'm not sure what the maximum was. I can't remember if there were maybe four to a room at a time. But I think we all need some individual space. And when you have moved from a home into a health care facility, I can't imagine if I had to downsize, right size, and give up all my little treasures and um, maybe not be able to take my favorite quilt or my favorite pillow with me. Um, there are so many considerations that I've seen over the years that do address some of those issues. Those with dementia, maybe um, you can't leave things out on a shelf. They could be taken and walked off and a resident might not know they've done that. I've seen facil newer facilities now built where some a resident's treasures, a few of them, can be housed under glass coverage so they won't disappear. And I think those of us that work with those, you know, with mental health challenges, if there's a safe environment, whether it's their own room, that can be as normalized as possible, that's something that those of us in this field should be considering. And I hope would be provided if I should ever need that level of care. Okay. So, so Joy, is there anything else that, that we haven't talked about? Any other memories about Moira and about what she, what that, the pretty exciting projects for a young graduate? <laughs> um, I know I have somewhere at home a copy a copy of a couple of, I don't know what we called it, but Moira established at George Derby Center, I believe like a monthly newsletter, and had residents contribute to that. Now, for instance, if they couldn't write, one of us would be the scribe and take down their notes. And then if there was anyone that maybe had trouble reading it, we could assist them reading the George Derby news, whatever. When I took leave of absence for my rowing endeavors at the Olympic level, Moira did everything to encourage the residents to follow me from a distance. It was so sweet. Um, and I can try and look up. I know I have them somewhere at home and maybe photocopy to send them to you, but they, that really touched my heart. Moira was able to incorporate with my love and um, passion for Olympic competition, she got the residents of George Derby Center to embrace my journey too, and they loved it. In fact, often, um, well, once a week, as a matter, when one resident was transferred back to Shaughnessy Hospital in Vancouver and ended up staying there for a little more acute care treatment, he would send out once a week five chocolate bars to me and a $2 donation because he knew with my rowing endeavors that I needed all the extra calories possible, maybe not so much the sugar, but I love them. <laughs> and that was so sweet. Through interdepartmental mail, this resident would send to me $2 plus about five chocolate bars. Well, I ended up sh indeed sharing the chocolate. I didn't need that, those chocolate bars that much. And I ended up sharing those. But it was really Moira's way of having my support team, where the residents I had left to pursue a selfish endeavor, but she involved them. And then a big welcome home. And um, I can certainly look up in my album somewhere where I've got a few of those George Derby press, whatever it was called, and residents contributed to that. So I'm also getting a sense of Moira as a professional who was willing to do a little blurring of that professional client divide in, in appropriate ways, right? Very appropriate. Indeed, uh, in healthcare, we often might, for very good reasons, keep our personal life very separate from residents we work with. But at George Derby Center, during my 
Olympic endeavors and training, uh, Moira just thought, well, let's get these fellas supporting you and, you know, that kind of thing. And um, it was fine by me. I certainly wasn't against that at all. I was okay with that, to have them involved in my cheering squad. And um, I'll photocopy some of those yeah. uh, sentiments. But I'm thinking, too, that she brought her dog in. Yes. That there's pictures of your husband at Valley View. You know, yes. so there is a there is a bit of a cr crossover, which I believe it was. Mm -hmm. Anyways, through uh, through <laughs> working with Moira at both George Derby Center and Valley View Hospital, if we looked within a mile radius of those facilities, there are elementary schools nearby, there are high schools nearby, music programs at high schools, delightful children's choirs, whatever. Um, when we're working in facilities, we need to look outside the facilities to see how we can involve people that might live right next door and until they're invited into the facility have never crossed the threshold of the door in. So just encourage um, youth studying these professions wherever your clientele are located, know your neighborhood out there, involve, normalize life as best possible and whatever's appropriate in your scenario. Yeah. And it's as if Moira kind of, but these, I think these things were kind of new. They, they weren't unheard of. I mean, I remember uh -huh. as a girl guide going to sing at an old age home. Yes. But she was really... Mm -hmm. She was thinking from every side yeah. of it too, huh? Moira was, as I've said before, in the top 5% of the bell curve. A real leader, passionate, loving, caring. Yes. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you know what I'm going to... Sure. It's going to screw up the pictures entirely, but I'm going to bring... I'm going to bring oh, up sure. Over. Oh, do you want to just be looking down on them with your camera to get some of those? Do you no, want? I'm gonna. I'm, what I'm gonna do is borrow your book, and and then I'm gonna return them to you. Yes, indeed. So Fine. What I can do, you know, what I think I'm gonna do is scan the pictures, and then I'll put what I think it, they are. And, and then, then I can comment. And you can comment sure. On them. Sure. Um, okay. No, I think that um, I'm hoping this stupid thing worked. But I can't really deal with it if it didn't. So I think we can thankfully stop the interview oh, yes. unless yes. has forgotten anything that you think is really important. Oh. You've just said you've given me this being really rich. Oh, great. I'm very grateful. All based on my the, recall or lack of recall. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I think your memories of George Derby are sharper because it was so fresh. You know how it is with your, you've got two children? Yes. Yeah. So you remember every milestone with the first one. The yes. second one, it's like, so fuzzier. Well, what was the first Exactly. Word? So I think that you at George Derby were so, it was so fresh to you that your memories of George Derby are, are more clear than Valley View. And I worked longer there, you see, than 79, because I took one year off, which Moira gave me permission, while at Valley View, really, to train full time for the Olympic Games in 1980. So I don't like to call it a sacrifice because we choose the endeavors to pursue. But I felt knowing it was my last chance and in the sport of rowing, I was always the smallest. I felt I had to train harder than everybody else. Not that I did, um, but, and Moira was so good for that. I could ride on my noon hour munching on a sandwich, the indoor bicycle at George Derby Center in the physiotherapy department, <laughs> um, to just train that much harder. And then, of course, the Olympic boycott. That was disappointing. Oh, okay. da, da, da. that's okay. I think we're done. Yeah. yeah. I think we're done. That has been great. Okay, okay so let's just so 